Hey, hockey fans, T-Boss is 13-3 and three here with another top-shelf guest, Houghton, Michigan native, former Green Bay gambler, former St. Cloud State Husky, and former Colorado Avalanche and Toronto Maple Leaf Jeff Finger. This episode is sponsored by Riverside Bike and Skate and Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Mogi. We are here at the D Stadium in uh, Houghton, Michigan on a gorgeous summer day. And uh, Jeff has been nice enough to give us an hour of his time. And we're going to talk about his hockey journey. So thanks so much for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, guys. It's, uh, it's great. And welcome back to the Copper Country. <laughs> Thank yeah, you. Yeah. And it's always Glad nice you're here in the home. summer. There you Glad go. you're here in the summer for once. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> hey, you know what? We want to talk about your career, but what are you doing now? Well, I'm an uh, assistant coach for the high school team here. We're sitting in the locker room at uh, D Stadium of the Houghton High School hockey team. And... Uh, and also a stay-at-home dad. My uh, fiance works during the day, so I got a three and a five-year-old, and uh, I get the pleasure of staying at home with them during the day. And uh, by the time it's time to go to practice, I'm ready for her to get home, ready and, to uh, go, head, head to the rink. You know, but, yeah, that's, uh, no, that's not good. an easy gig, is it? It is not. It no. is not. Much respect to uh, to anyone else who has to stay at, stay at home with the with the young children. But three and five, does that mean you're still in game shape chasing young kids around? I wouldn't necessarily go that far, but, uh, you know, I'm, we're, we're trying to keep it. We're trying to stay in shape. I get up early and uh, go go lift with the football and hockey team up at the high school. And, uh, you know, we're, we're trying still. You know, I'm 43. I would like to try to try to stay as young as I can, you know, for as long as I can. Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it gets harder. I can already tell I need luck. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, what's that like coming back to your alma mater, helping out with the team? Uh, you know, ever since I played high school hockey, my, the freshman, I've always said this, the, my freshman year at Houghton was probably the most fun I've ever had playing hockey, like through all the, through all the levels and teams I've played for. That freshman year, for some reason, it was, it was so much fun. It's like kind of the first year you really get some fans you know, to your games and, you know, you get to wear your jersey to the, to the to school on game day, all that kind of stuff. Get out of school early, maybe to go to practice. or And uh, I just have wonderful memories of being here. Uh, coach Don Miller was my coach for the couple of years I played at Houghton. And uh, it's just always – I've always had great memories of it. In high school hockey, I believe – you know, the reason why I really enjoy uh, coaching high school age kids is because it's kind of before the politics and everything get into it and before there's any money involved or scholarships or any of that kind of um, stuff that uh, could turn political, you know what I mean, oh, in, the, in yeah. the hockey game. Like, uh, so I, it's still, like, uh, at its pure form, you know, and I, sure. and I really, really enjoy that about coaching these age kids. You know, as you, as you get your, yourself up the levels, you know, you got a million kids at mites and then the squirts goes down. When you made the high school team as a freshman, did you kind of feel like that was a dream come true for you at that time? It was. It was. It was a big deal. I remember – my dad giving me a ride home that day and just him saying how proud he was of me. And, uh, it was just, it was, a uh, it was a big day and, and that it was really fun. I got to play a lot on that team as a freshman and, and we were pretty darn successful. We went down state, which is a big deal for the teams that come out of up here. You know, if you make, if you can make it down state to the tournament, um, it's a big deal. So lots of great memories of that for sure. Awesome. What's that like playing in an iconic D Stadium, you know, birthplace of, of professional hockey. And, and when the fans are coming in here, the rink's cold, everybody's bundled and close together. <laughs> you know, what's the, what's the atmosphere like here during a hockey game? Well, it's, it's amazing. Like when we play Hancock, when we play Calumet, um, you know, we'll, we'll pack them in here pretty good. And, it, and it's really neat. It can get loud in here. We got our siren going and, and all that. And to be honest, I guess I, I have more appreciation for it now than I did maybe when you're a young kid like that, once that you get to move on and, and play other rinks and uh, see many other places, you know, and play other places that uh, you kind of, you kind of realize um, what a neat place this is and uh, what a neat building this is and the history in here, you know, yeah. it is so, something else. So how'd you get involved with the game? Is it a family thing or not your buddies get along? Not necessarily. Well, growing up up here, um, you, you, in some ways, you don't really have a choice, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, there's some long winners up here, as uh, a lot of people know. And, uh, if you aren't, 
um, involved in something in the winter, a recreation, whether it's hockey, whether it's skiing, whether it's fishing, snowmobiling, stuff like that. If you don't, it, it'd be some long winters if you didn't have, uh, if you didn't have a, a hobby like that, you know, growing up. And uh, I, I don't know, I can't necessarily, my dad, of course, always gave me the opportunity. It wasn't, uh, you know, there wasn't, he, it was just always there, you know, and we have a lot of ice up here as well, which a lot of outdoor rinks, a lot of indoor rinks in terms of per capita, the amount of people that are here, there's a lot of ice. So it's kind of, I guess it was, it's just kind of a natural fit, you know, growing up up here. And what age did you get introduced? Uh, I started skating when I was around three or four. I remember my mom used to work up at the ticket office at the SDC and, uh, so I'd always go to public skating up there. And then, you know, there was always, there was always ice, you know, whether it's an outdoor rink, you know, growing up with your friends. I think times are a little bit different now where the kids growing up now um, basically have other things to do uh, where we didn't really have anything else to do. You know what I'm saying? Oh, and yeah. Especially in the winter time. So there was numerous outdoor rinks and they, and they do a great job um, taking care of the rinks and stuff up here, especially the outdoor ones. And, uh, you know, it was just kind of always there. And during those, those months where it's cold, uh, <laughs> we're, we'd probably be at the rink, when, when, you know, most days, you know. Did you have a mentor looking back, you know, either youth hockey or high school hockey that you look back and kind of helped propel you to the next level? Um, you know, it, of course, your parents were always, you know, behind you and everything else. But uh, coaches like... Uh, there's a family up here, the DeRocher family, and their father, uh, Leo DeRocher, he's a well-known figure up here. Rest in peace, Leo. But uh, he, uh, he coached me, I think, nearly all my junior high. I grew up with his, with his age boys. So uh, they were always – I played with them a lot, Andre and Darren. And, uh, and then Don Miller was our high school coach, who's kind of a legendary UP coach too. So. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So thousands and thousands of hockey players have come through the ranks in the UP. And when I was doing some research, you are known as the best all around player to be born and raised and trained in the UP in the modern era. How the heck did that come about? Well, that's, that's very generous of you to say, <laughs> but uh, you know, I, I don't know. It was just uh, one of those things where we spent so much time at the rink and it was, it was never, it was never, uh, kind of the plan I, I guess you know it was never the plan to be able to do something like that but it was always I guess the dream yeah. you know um, I remember after getting to a certain age the goal would be you know was to kind of get to college like if you could play especially growing up in uh, the same town as tech I got to go to a lot of tech games as a kid and sure so growing up um, being able to see those games and, and the level of hockey as it was, that was always kind of a goal, I guess, is to make it to college. I didn't necessarily think I was going to be division one, but, uh, you know, just wanting to play college hockey. And then, you know, of course, grew up watching, uh, CBC and hockey night in Canada every Saturday night on the bunny years, you know, yeah. we oh, yeah. had the TV with, uh, the tinfoil on the, on the antennas <laughs> and everything. And we'd, we'd have to adjust a few times a game, the antenna to get the game in. Okay. But we, that's, I just, those, those are some great memories just watching hockey night in Canada and going to tech games and stuff as a kid. So did you play other sports? I did. I played baseball up until I was about 13. I really loved baseball and, and was pretty good. Um, it just, it, it turns into, uh, you know, r r I feel like when I was growing up, that's where hockey or now, as you guys know, I'm sure young kids, like if you want to play hockey, it becomes nearly a, t a 12 month a year sport at this point, you know? And, uh, I feel like it kind of started turning toward that way when I was, when I was a kid, you know, like we not, not necessarily playing 12 months, but there was a lot of summer stuff going on and, uh, stuff like that. So that, you know, it's just, uh, that's, you know, that's kind of where it was at. I ended up quitting, I believe, or, or say retire from baseball at 13. <laughs> but, uh, and so I was a heck of a career. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh boy. Gave it his right. all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I played, I played some baseball until I was about 13. And then, uh, I played football my freshman year for about a half a season until, uh, I got hurt. And then, and then it was one of those things we had, uh, 
I made the varsity team as a football player as a freshman as well. And uh, but we only we had uh, fourteen guys on our team. Oh, so so it was Ironman football at uh, the varsity level, and you're playing some some big playing tough, against some big boys. Yeah, big tough kids, and uh, ended up twisting my ankle against Antonagan one time. And then my dad kind of wasn't having it. He he kind of because I already had at that point there was some some summertime tournaments or you know what that would be fall fall type tournaments before the high school season that uh where a russian team would come up here and play we had kind of a, a q and r a copper country selects team <clears throat> excuse me at that uh at that age and uh and it once once i hurt myself i was kind of i didn't i didn't like i liked football but i didn't like it as much nearly as much as i liked hockey so sure. kind of made a decision there once you know and like i said it was just tough playing those other sports meaning you know playing varsity as a freshman and Iron Man with thirteen. That's asking or a lot for a fourteen-year-old yeah, against eighteen-year-olds. And my year dad, olds. I could tell he really, uh, he could see kind of, you know, he he had a bad feeling. I think if I would have kept playing football, or you know what I mean, I kind of got the the vibes from him. I would say that sure, it might be time to make a decision. So, so you played high school Houghton as a freshman, then you went AAA as a sophomore. You came back to Houghton as a junior, and then you went to the Gamblers your senior year. Right. So, what was the reason for the the move from Houghton and then back to Houghton, and I, I kind of understand the the move to the Gamblers. Right. Well, um, after my freshman year, like I said, it was one of my funnest years. And then uh, we were lucky enough back then we had the Marquette Electricians, which was a AAA uh, midget team um, that had mostly UP kids from other than, you know, maybe three or four kids. We had a kid from Colorado, our goaltender, and a couple kids from Alaska. But other than that, um, the team that we put together my sophomore year in Marquette was was amazing. We ended up winning the state championship. We bought, we beat uh, Little Caesars for like the first time in 14 oh, years. Wow! That they had lost, and uh, and then uh, we ended up taking third in nationals. We lost to Scott Gomez's Alaska All Stars <laughs> oh. in the in the semi national finals, and I think we were up. We were up by like uh, two goals in the third period, and I, th I think he ended up scoring like a hat trick to win the game. And like, <laughs> so it was uh, that that was a real bummer because we we definitely could have could have been national champs that year too. But th the team that we had in Marquette was was amazing. There was probably five to eight D one players on on just that team in midgets. So uh, wow. a lot of kids played at Northern. Um, Myself went to St. Cloud and, you know, there, it was just, we, we had a great team, but, uh, to get back to the question when, so the reason why I came back my junior year was kind of like, I knew I was going to have to leave home my senior year and I was homesick, like as, as moving away from home at 15 years old. And even though it was only a hundred miles away, it, you might as well be, you know, 500 miles sure. away. Yep. Um, Marquette was fairly familiar with and stuff and I did have some friends from from the copper country that played on that team but uh it uh it was kind of a decision like that I knew if I wanted to pursue hockey I would have had to move away the next year and uh, I was just kind of like I want to get and having those great memories of my freshman year I was like I, I got it you know I really want to play for Holden one more year before I have to make a commitment and move elsewhere you know what i mean so sure. that that was kind of where that went but i'd say just being a 15 year old and then just being a little homesick you know um and just the memories i had from my freshman year here is i wanted to give it one more crack very cool so, understandable yeah, great reasoning. I'm, I'm sure the team enjoyed having you back too well i'm sure that yeah. didn't hurt huh <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh jeff's coming back <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, you end up with the Gamblers your senior year. Mm -hmm. Did you get drafted at that time? Was there a draft, or how did that how did that occur? Well, um, they used to sign tenders in the USHL back then, and uh, Don Granado was actually the coach of the Gamblers. Yeah. Who uh, he was he was the coach that tendered me. Um, so I ended up signing a, a tender with Green Bay, uh, and and. Uh, that's kind of how it happened. He, he offered. I, I'm not sure how I got on his radar or whatever. I don't know how any of that really worked out, but um, I'm really glad that it did. Oh, absolutely. Especially because I, I really loved Green Bay and uh, the fact that it was by far the closest team to home in oh, the sure. USHL, you know, still is by far, I think, you know, in that, in that league. Um, so that, that was one of the huge things as well for wanting to go to Green Bay and uh, making that decision. And then Don had me down for a visit um, when they were in the playoffs the, the previous year to when I started. 
And uh, so I went down there and got to see some playoff games and, and see how the kind of fans and, and, and how that USHL really works. And that's, that's a, it's, it's a giant step up um, to go there. But it was just super exciting for me to be able to go down there and, uh, and witness that, the playoff games and stuff in, in Green Bay. So that was, that was really a ball. So you ended up playing for Coach Marco Siki. He's uh, been a uh, on our podcast. Yes, seems yes, like I did. I saw seems that like he's well. quite a guy. Tell us a little bit about him. Yeah, he was. Uh, um, he was a one of the most influential coaches, I'd say, in, in my career at at that age and stuff. You're very impressionable, and uh, and he was he was great to me. Um, he Don ended up moving on. Don ended up moving on. Um, prior to my first season down there and then mark okay. took over so it was kind of the luck of the draw that i guess i was really lucky that uh that mark uh took over that team and and he was a defenseman similar to myself in terms of uh hard nose and uh you know kind of a stay-at-home guy and so he was he was able to give me a lot of guidance in terms of you know growing up and as you mature as a defenseman so that that was very very important i think to my career you mentioned <clears throat> defenseman, um, and as you you were known as a hard nosed defenseman. How did you end up in that position? You meaning defense? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I don't I don't really know to be honest. Uh, maybe it was because I just uh, for, uh, everyone knows as a D man you don't necessarily have to skate as much as a forward or a, or a <laughs> oh, centerman. Come on, would. don't give that <laughs> secret up. Oh, like we don't know it, right? <laughs> So that's, that's the, that's the beauty of that. Um, you know, you just play hard in your own end and then you get to go stand on the blue line in the offensive zone. So I uh, hope somebody dishes it back to you exactly. so you can get a shot. Yeah. So you can take a slap shot. That was, that was a big deal when you're a young kid, you know? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I really don't know. I ended up, uh, playing back there on defense and always enjoyed it. And it was just kind of where I stuck, I guess. You were with the gamblers and Last year you were there. You guys won the Clark Cup. You're the defenseman of the year. You know, that's a big thing. Uh, Mogi and I this last year got a chance to sip from the Clark Cup. Um, yeah, we did. And, did yeah, after Sioux City, Sioux City won. Yeah. won it, and the, the manager came with the cup back to Eau Claire, and we got to sip from it. I mean, it was a big deal for these two old farts, but <laughs> what was it like for a young buck to, you know, to win that thing oh. and, and to be the honors that you got? Yeah, no, it was amazing. And uh, I, w- I remember I wore, the, I wore the C that year for Green Bay, so I was, I was the one that got to go hoist it oh, when, when oh, we won. So very cool. I just remember how heavy the damn thing was. You know, and it's it's not like uh, I don't I don't know how much it weighs or anything, but after a game and stuff, the big wooden cup with or it's big. you know, yeah, it is big and it's heavy. And uh, I just remember trying to hoist it up, and there's not really anywhere to grab. You know, like you see the guys when they hoist the Stanley Cup. There's two. It seems like there's two handles on that thing. <laughs> so, uh, but no, I, that's those are those are some great memories, and that that was a, a great year. You know, so uh, you played 161 games with those guys in. Uh, Unless my math is incorrect, you uh, earned 561 penalty minutes. So we're guessing you played with a little bit of an edge. Where'd that edge come from? Well, um, the one little story when I was when I was younger, uh, a guy that worked for my dad. My dad used to own a painting company up here, and uh, a guy that worked for my dad, uh, Vic Betterly. I don't know if my dad told him to come to me and say this, but I'll never forget this. And I was and I was young. I was probably around 12 or something when and and. Uh, I was talking to Vic in our living room and he was just like, yeah, your dad said you got to be a little tougher in front of the net, you know, and kind of, I remember thinking, my dad told you that, you know, like then geez, maybe I do, you know, and it was kind of one of those things where you, I just kept kind of, kind of progressively, I guess, got meaner. And then the, the, uh, my whole thing was in terms of playing defense is I wanted to be like the hardest guy on the ice to play against, you know what I mean? For, for other guys to play against. I wanted to be hard and, and, you know, I, I didn't want them to want to play against me. You know what I mean? It was kind of one of those yeah, things. So competitor. Yeah, I guess so. And then, uh, so I kind of just went with that for, for the whole time. It, it became a, a balancing act of playing on the edge and not taking too many stupid penalties. As, as you could see on those numbers, <laughs> there was many a minor penalty for uh, stick work and, uh, dirty stuff. But, uh, you know, it was in the end, it was all able to balance out and, uh, you know, when you when you learn a few things and and realize that 
that uh, you can't always do that sort of thing. Then, you know, you kind of smarten up a little bit as you mature and get a little older. But at first there was definitely, you know, um, it, it was uh, it was a little rough down there in front of the net for sure. You, know? you learn to be a little sneakier. That's it. Look around, yeah. is rough looking yeah, or not? It. Okay, yeah. here we go, a little two-hander. That's it. You got to be smarter. <laughs> you got to well, be smarter. You know? I, I'm guessing based on these numbers that guys did not want to be in front of the net with you, and and so you you got your wish. Yeah. If you're coming in front of Mr. Finger, you're gonna <laughs> yeah, you're gonna pay. You're gonna pay. You yeah. Know? So yeah. I've heard. Yeah. The some of the guys that I played against a lot in the USHL ended up being my teammates and stuff. Um, in in uh, St. Cloud, you know, and and uh, even you know through the pros and whatnot. But uh, I, I remember them mentioning a few things that they still might have a knot on the back of their calf or something from <laughs> from playing against me. So. Um, <laughs> Anyways, so they liked but, having you on the team, but they didn't want to play against right. you. Right, and that's, yeah, I guess, one of the best compliments a, a hockey bet. player could get. You, you know? bet. Absolutely. Okay, <clears throat> you live in a town with the Michigan Tech Huskies, D1. How did you end up at St. Cloud State? Well, hold on. Not only that, but there's six other D1 programs in the state, for crying out loud. Right? Well, yeah. So we got 71, you're a Michigan native. St. Cloud State yep, Huskies. Yep. No, I know. It is It is odd. Um, so what happened was my first year in the USHL in Green Bay, um, Tech, I was obviously on their radar, and uh, and I had originally signed my letter of intent with Tech. Okay. okay. And then it's uh, – and I kind of did it as, you know, maybe – maybe uh kind of jumped on it before i mean i was just excited to hear that a d1 team wanted me to come play for them it's not to mention your hometown team you know that was always a dream as well um and then once uh once i got through my first year and then into my second year kind of started progressing as a player and then um my coach would tell me about all the other teams that were kind of interested and kind of how did you know and i like big time teams you know and it was uh so i kind of it got me thinking and i was like dude you know, do I want to stay at home for my four years there? Like after hearing the interest from other schools and whatnot. Okay. Um, so it became a thing where I was like, I don't know if I want to go there. And I really started second guessing my decision. I might've maybe pulled the trigger too soon on coming to tech. And, and if anyone remembers back in those days, tech, they, they weren't the strongest team. I'll, I'll just put it that way. They, they were, they were, they had a few uh, real lean years up here and those were in that era kind of. And, uh, and I just remember thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if, if I, if I want to, if I want to play up here and be in the fishbowl where there's been many local kids that have played up here and still do, of course. And, uh, but you are in a fishbowl coming from here and where sure. everybody knows you. And, uh, and to be honest, that was probably one of the, the major, turning points or decisions that I made was, was to, to, you know, get out of that letter of intent, which I did ha I had to go to school in Green Bay and apply. I was a full-time student my last year in Green Bay. So, wow. so that's the only way out of the letter of intent back then was you had to transfer to another school. So I had to go to UWGB, uh, full-time student. And then, and then I was able to transfer and, uh, and after seeing St. Cloud and I went on a visit there and whatnot, and it was, uh, they, they, it seemed kind of like more my up my alley, you know. I mean, you you guys are aware of you know the WCHA back then and stuff, and how you know in Minnesota there's there's the Gophers kind of, and then there's everyone else. Yep. But yep. there's many many good hockey players out of the Midwest and you know and Canadians and whatnot too. Um, so it was like the St. Cloud was almost kind of like the. I don't know what the right way to put it. Maybe the bad news bears of uh, Minnesota in terms of, yeah. if, if you know what I mean, you okay, know, all the, the, all the blue chippers go to Minnesota yeah, and then all the second, you know, tier guys, which are still damn good. And I played against many of them in the USHL, um, you know, would, would pick the other schools up there. It was right when Mankato was getting started. UMD and, had been there a long yeah, time, yes, but yep. yeah, St. Cloud really, so, really led and, the way. Yeah. And then I went on a visit there and uh, it was kind of, it just seemed more my speed, you know, the t the type of blue collar guys that uh, and program that it was back then, and uh, and it was uh, so that that led a lot to the decision, and it was and it was one of the most pivotal decisions that I believe I ever made. Because who knows if I would have came to Tech, I'm sure it would have been great, and you know, but I don't know where I would have ended up then. You know what I mean? Just even getting a look or or the opportunity on you know playing on a 
a lower end division one team, you know, looking to want to be a professional player. Um, that's those teams I played on at St. Cloud. We, we probably turned out nearly eight out of the, all that. There might be eight NHLers that I played with through the three years in St. Cloud that were on that team, maybe wow. even more. So, um, there were some really good hockey yeah. players. We had a, we had some good teams those yeah. years in St. Cloud. So it was, uh, by far the best decision I made in terms of personally for, for my career and, and development, I feel like. You know, you mentioned the old WCHA and, and I miss that. Old I do too. I do okay. too. Yeah. And, I, and I was going to ask you, you know, how you feel about that and, and where D1 hockey's now gone. You know, you've got the Big Ten, CCHA, and NCHC, but the WCHA has kind of kind of fizzled out. What are your thoughts on was was that good move or I? You know, I'm sure some people think it was and this and that. I'm I'm not. I loved the old WCHA. That's where I grew up watching yep. with Tech being in there and stuff. And what was so neat is that you'd get. Uh, teams like big time teams coming to, up here to play you know whether it was wisconsin north dakota you know denver cc you know all these all these different teams would would come up and play at tech so i'd be able to watch these big time teams play and the, you know they had blue chip you know number first round draft picks on on the a lot of these other teams yeah. that would come play it was it was just really neat uh, and the the league was just really strong back then and oh, yeah. uh so, and I guess basically all the teams that were in that league um, were a lot of the top teams in the entire country. You know, I know oh, yeah. Hockey East and all, they have their stuff out there, but uh, and the CCHA, of course, but um, the WCHA was, was really, really exciting, fun league. Who was your biggest rivalry? At St. Cloud? Yes. Um, it'd have to be the Gophers. But I, but I think they're everyone's biggest rivalry. If you're, if you're a Minnesota school and you're not the Gophers, I think the Gophers are your biggest rival, whether they know it or not. <laughs> you know what <laughs> well, I mean? Okay. We've talked to a few Gophers, yeah. and trust me, they all knew they had a target on them. It's like yeah. everybody, everybody shoots for the Gophers. For sure, yeah. for sure. And I mean, understandable. Yeah. You know, great program, yep. long tradition. When you, uh, when you live in Minnesota and you get to see, um, before they had an NHL team, I mean, the Gophers – were the show back then you know what i mean it was it was really something actually how much how famous those guys were or you know however how big the golfers were and if you got to go play there and, and they always got their their own guys you know there was very few guys that weren't you know native minnesotans got to got to uh play on that team but uh so yeah and then it so the, I would have to say them. I remember a few times at the Herb Brooks Center playing against the Gophers, how loud. I mean, I think we almost blew the roof out that, off that place a couple times when the Gophers came to town. You know, it was, it was really something. And we were really competitive with them. They were always, of course, really good. Yeah. But uh, we had some great teams. And uh, so they were always in for a great game and always a war, you know. So we're going to give a quick shout out to one of our sponsors. Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine has been committed to the healthcare needs of patients in Western Wisconsin since 1954. The orthopedic surgeons and athletic trainers serve many uh, area schools. Their success and reputation as an outstanding orthopedic clinic can be attributed to the teamwork of friendly, knowledgeable physicians and staff. And they recently got me back in the game with a little rotator cuff surgery. I think that's probably one of nine or ten that they've performed on this whole body, and they keep getting me back in the game. So I give them kudos. Uh, absolutely. So, Jeff, you were drafted by the Colorado Avalanche in the eighth round back in 1999. How excited were you for that moment? Well, very excited. Once I found out what happened, um, I, you know, I didn't expect anything. It was It's kind of a funny story. I was... My mother was living in uh, Mackinac City at the time, and uh, and I went down there for the summer to work and to just kind of spend my summer down there. And uh, so I was, I was working at uh, Mackinac Pasty Company. Oh, oh <laughs> I like it. So I worked at a, at a pasty shop, a pasty ice cream shop down there. And uh, uh oh, was that dangerous for you? Well, I'm <laughs> I'm definitely susceptible to uh, to sweets and to eating, but. Uh, it uh, no, it was it was a great summer. I started. I actually worked on the on the ferry boats for for a, cu a couple of weeks, and then I decided that's too, that was uh, it was too time consuming as a you know seventeen eighteen year old kid. I was like, I want a little more time for my summer and not have to sit on the boats all day. But 
but it, that was a great experience. But the boat getting back to the draft part, um, my mother called me at, at work one day and I was like, what are you, you know, I was kind of, they said, your mom's on the phone. I'm like, hey, why are you calling me at where, you know, what's going on? And then, uh, she said, or she said something like, do you know anything about the Colorado avalanche? And I'm like, well, they just won the Stanley cup. Like, that, you know, what do you mean? What, what do I know about them? And then she told me that Michelle Goulet had called her, called our home there and, uh, and told her that I was drafted by them. And I, I was just, it was completely unexpected. And, uh, you know, very exciting, but, uh, you know, I, it, it, it totally blindsided me. I didn't, I didn't really expect, you know, to be, as you can see by, it was eighth round, I believe 240th overall, which is getting near the end. But, uh, you know, just, just the fact that I was drafted was, it, it was a really neat thing and a big deal, you know, for me personally. So that was really cool. Well, not only were you drafted, you know, you mentioned eighth round, and I think everybody understands that, you know, the higher rounds and, you know, you get down there, it, your chances of making it get less and less. Eight years from being drafted till you play your first NHL game. Yeah. What, what kept you grinding? Well, it was kind of, uh, it was once, once uh, you start playing at those, each level you step up. Like, so for instance, when I went from, you know, high school to the Green Bay Gamblers, and then you start playing against guys like, uh, Ruslan Fedotenko was one guy that was in our league. He played at Sioux City. Okay. And, uh, and I, I, I think he was, so I played against him for a couple of years. And then I remember he, I think he made the NHL like two years after I played against him in, in when he was in Sioux City. And I, and then so the, the more steps you make, it's kind of like, I played against that guy. And it's like, I, I did good against that. You know, or, you know, you're, you're comparing sure. yourself yeah. and that's kind of how it works. And so the, the, the more steps you make, the more guys that you played against and, and with that, uh, are, are, are moving on. And, you know, whether it's playing D1 or playing in the pros and you're like, what the heck? You're like, you know, it becomes closer. You know, you're not as far as you may think you are. Like, yeah, I, I was just playing against some of these guys and now you're watching them on TV and stuff. And it's like, so that, that became more of kind of like maybe the, the carrot on a stick, you know, kind of thing. Sure. So. You're just, you, you see things like that and, uh, and it's, it, it's just, uh, all you can do is just keep improving yourself and, and then, you know, and then the more you progress at every level, the more, or you're going to progress as long as you're still working hard and stuff for the most part. And, uh, and luckily enough, I did. So it just, it just kind of, I just kept grinding, I guess, back to the, you know, I, I, I kept grinding is all I can say. And it was always the dream. And I, I could have died if, if the, they let me play one game, you know, back then is, is how you're thinking as a, as a young man. And, uh, um, so that, that was kind of it. It was just, uh, I just kept going and, and always had that dream alive kind of thing. And then once you're in the American League and stuff like that, and you're playing a lot of minutes in the American League, then it's like, what the heck? You're, there's guys on your team that are playing that you've played with and that are playing in the NHL. And you're like, well, after you get to see people every day at practice and like, you know, you know, like there's, there's not that big of a difference from the American League to the NHL in terms of, you know, whether the skill levels and stuff, obviously the high end guys, you know, it's, it's a different story, but I'm saying, and I'm, I was talking about just give me a shift, you know? <laughs> so, so it was kind of one of those deals. I was like, you know, if I could, if I could ever say that I was an NHL or then, uh, you know, it's pretty that, cool. Yeah. That was good enough for me. So, well, you mentioned, you know, you kept grinding and you're looking at these guys, but you had to put that effort in and you had to stay in shape. So what was your workout regiment like both during and the season and in the off season to keep going. Well, that, that was another, um, big learning curve. I would say as a, as a young man and even, even in, in that era, I would say where, you know, there, there wasn't this, uh, you know, high school kids hiring trainers and, you know, the skills coaches and, and all this stuff, which there is these days. Um, so it was just kind of, you know, the, that was a big learning curve is learning how to work out learning how to diet. Um, that was always one of my issues is I, like a lot of kids have a hard time putting weight on. I, I was the one that had a hard time keeping it off. You know what I mean? All so those pasties I, and yeah, ice cream. Right, that's right. <laughs> so I, I had to learn how to be super disciplined with my diet and, and stuff like that, where I could, um, keep the weight down to be able to be fast enough 
to play to keep up with those guys that was always kind of a knock you know that was what all the you know scouts or whoever would tell me is you got to work on your skating got to work on your skating which I, they probably tell everyone that but you know <laughs> but it's uh it, it, it was true that was probably one of the weaker um aspects of my game but um in college i would i would i remember i was like 220 pounds in college and uh and i was really strong but big and heavy you know um and that was by the time i ended up making it to the nhl i was 205 pounds so you kind of realize every year i progress and i'd lose a little more weight and kind of a little bit faster and then lose a little more weight the next year a little bit faster so it's kind of like you figure out what works for you or what has to be done you know for you to make it to that next level because uh if i would have just you know if you're bullheaded and you think like this is me this is what this is what I am if they don't like it, you know, but that's not how that works. You right. know what I mean? <laughs> so it's like, if you want to keep playing, you figure a way out. Um, you figure, you figure out what to do to, uh, to try to excel at the next level. So, and that's kind of how that worked. You know, I'm a young hockey player listening to this podcast and I'm listening to you saying, you know, you got to put in the effort and so forth, but if you had a message to a young hockey player that wanted to get to that next level, what would that message be? Well, that's, that's a great question. And first of all, it has to be your drive and, and your want. You know, like the old cliche, like how bad do you want it? But it really, it really, in my opinion, comes down to that. Like, what are you willing to sacrifice to, to get yourself to the next level, whether that is juniors, whether that is college, whether that is pros? You know, um, there's new sacrifices you'll have to make at each one of those steps. And, uh, and it comes back down to how much do you want to sacrifice? And, you know, some people are willing to sacrifice this, but not that. Um, for myself, once I got to college, it was kind of like, I, I didn't give myself any other options. You know what I mean? It was, it was just, uh, I had one, I gave myself one option. Of course, there, if, if need be, there would be other, you know, meaning have to go get a job, but people ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> so it's kind of one of those things. And, uh, and, and that's kind of how it worked for me. I'm, you know, I'm blessed and lucky that, that, that did work out for me in terms of being able to play. But, uh, you know, I think if you put in whatever effort and sacrifice you put into hockey, I think if I applied that to anything else in my life, it would have, I, it would have been, you would have been okay. You know what I mean? If you put yeah. that level of effort and sacrifice in to what uh, we did in hockey, um, I think you'd be okay in life, whatever you may do, you know, so. Well, that's great advice for our listeners too. So understand if you don't make it in hockey, those same, that same dedication and, and drive will, will make you successful. So the, the odds, the odds of making it, as you guys know, are very slim. And I, I feel like one of the luckiest guys in the world just to be able to make it through healthy and, and all that. Cause there could have been many things that happened, uh, that derailed, that derailed someone's career, you know? Oh, absolutely. Whether it's an injury or a woman or who knows, you know? <laughs> Actually, that was, my, that was my next question. Did you have any injuries over your career that stalled your development or your advancement? Well, there was, there, I had a, you know, a lot of injuries, obviously, but mo I was like, again, I was really lucky in terms of that. Um, mostly broken hands, broken feet, uh, broken collarbone. But uh, one of the worst injuries I had, which was one of the closest, was when I was in St. Cloud, um, I got cut on my wrist. And you can still see the scar right here. Where Holy the, cow. So was, the cut was from there to there. And then they did surgery because I hit some tendons in the artery in my wrist. Oh. I uh, collided with my old buddy, Matt Hendricks. I don't know if you know that name. He works. He, he had a long NHL career as well. Um, he works for the Wild, I think, at this point. But he's from Blaine, Minnesota. And... Uh, yeah, we were, we were playing shinny hockey after the season and me and him would kind of, we were, we were matched up well in terms of size and stuff. So we'd always lift together and battle hard together on the ice and practice hard against each other. And, uh, and we were just in our shin pads and our, you know, and sweatpants and just sure. kind of messing around after the season. We had some ice and he had kind of, I was one on one playing him on a one on one and he kind of, I might have tripped him or something and he kind of fell on his, he fell on his belly. And his skates or his knees were bent, and so his skates were exposed up top. And for some, my wrist 
ran across his skate oh. blade. So we had, luckily our trainer was in the building, but I'll never oh. forget when I, it felt like a, like a, like a stick burn. Like if you get hooked or something on yeah. your wrist or on your side, like it felt like a, a burn more than anything. And I looked down and, and I opened my wrist and it, it just started pouring. And there was a, 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 a line of blood from, from where it happened all the way. There was a big pool where it happened. And then there was a, a straight line of blood all the way to the trainer's room. And then, uh, went in there and they got, they got the towels on it and I don't know if they put a tourniquet or whatever, but they called the ambulance and, and then, and then the ambulance ended up going to the wrong building on the campus of St. Cloud. So so it seemed a lot longer (laughs) waiting for them than, uh, I don't know if they knew how serious it was or what, you know, they were thinking, meaning the ambulance drivers, but it was pretty, it was pretty hectic for sure. But, um, I was just missed the nerve, which would have been career ending. Um, if it would have, it nicked the artery. So if it would have completely severed the artery, different, different story. Yeah. If it would, have, I cut like three or four tendons. If they, if I would have cut some other ones, it would have been game over too. So, uh, that was one that, that was, uh, really lucky to get through that one. So, um, so yeah, there was many injuries, but that was probably the most dangerous, um, you know, looking back on it for sure. Wow. Holy crap. Yeah. You know, looking back at uh, your career in the NHL, you played with and against some Hall of Famers. I mean, you talked about just wanting a shift. Yeah. Okay? And now you're on the ice with a career playing with these guys. Two-sided question. Who did you like playing with the most on the ice? I mean, there had to be a teammate that stood out. And then the second part is, who was the competitor in front of the net that you wanted to just kick the crap out of? <laughs> well, many, I mean, there was many guys that battle at that level in front of the net. Um, but uh, in terms of playing with her teammates, I mean, Joe Sackick and uh, Rob Blake. Oh, yeah. Um, Adam Foote. So, like, those are just three off the top of my head, you know, especially when I first get into the league kind of thing. Um, cause I got, I got to spend quite a bit of time with the Avs before I even ever played a game. Uh, I, I played three and a half years pro before I even played my first game, or it might've even been a little more than three and a half years, but, um, in the A. Right. Okay. Yeah. So I'd, I'd get to go to training camp every year. And I remember after my first year at training camp, um, I was the last one cut. I think, uh, every year they had some heck of a teams in those days, the Avs, which they still do obviously, but, uh. They had some really good teams, so it was it was really hard for for a guy to make it straight out of camp that that hadn't played. Um, they kind of had their team set, you know, before training camp. Even they, you know, they, they already know really what's going on. I feel like before you're not going to get too many surprises out of training camp when you get to that level. Sure, unless there's injuries and whatnot, which is how I was able to finally get there. But uh, yeah. Yeah, guys like Joe Sackick and stuff. It was, you know, you're just like you're you're in you're in awe. You kind of feel like you're at fantasy camp, you know, when <laughs> when you get to go when you're on the ice with these guys and Milan Hayduk and Alex Tange and like it's just like what's going on? I just saw these guys hoist the cup a couple years ago, you know, and then and then you're out on the ice with them and stuff. And it was uh, my first one on one at my first uh, NHL training camp was against Paul Correa. Oh yeah! How'd that so, fit? How'd that go? I'll tell you what. I think I backed right into the goalie. <laughs> I, I just made sure I'd, I wasn't too close. You know, I made sure I made him shoot it. That's I'll <laughs> I'll say that. So I think when he was crossing the blue line, I was like already running into the goalie. <laughs> but uh, so I just made sure I didn't get beat wide or get beat through my legs or whatever. But uh, that's that was one one good memory for sure of my first my first camp. I'm going to give a shout out to Riverside Bike and Skate, Eau Claire Hockey Headquarters, which is the oldest hockey store in the state of Wisconsin. Buy hockey gear from the people that play and know the game. And don't forget about their bicycle sales and service, as well as your paddle sports center for kayaks and canoes. Now, Jeff, you played for both the Avalanche and the Toronto Maple Leafs in the NHL. So you played... In Canada, you played in the U.S. So what are some of the differences and similarities between those two organizations? Well, um, there's, there's a lot of, lot of differences. When, whenever you go to a Canadian market, it's, uh, it's a whole new ball game. You know what I mean? Um, just obviously that's their number one sport. That's, that's their game, they feel like. You know what I mean? And it's, uh, 
I, it's, it's, it's really intense. I'll put it that way compared to being a, you know, a middle of the road guy in Colorado. Um, my, the year I signed as a free agent with Toronto, I had a really good season the year before with Colorado. And then, uh, going from there to Toronto, it was just, I ended up going up there, I think a month and a half early before the season started. So there's not too much media around when you're skating and working out with the guys when you first get there. So you're kind of like, Oh, this isn't so bad. Right. Like <laughs> what, uh, what, what's all the, what's all the hubbub about or whatever, you know? And then, uh, as soon as training camp starts, it's a, it's a whole new ball game. There's, there's 40 to 50 people in your room after every practice, after every game. And it's, oh, uh, practice. it's, it's intense, you know? And, uh, I remember when I got my first scrum up in Toronto and of course, you know, I was, there was some questions about when I got signed because Toronto questions everything, of course, but understandably, you know, I'd only, I, I didn't even break a hundred, hundred games yet in the NHL. And, uh, so they were asking me about the GM's decision and I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it was a great move by him, you know, but, <laughs> but in my head, I'm thinking, you know, like you, you don't really want to tell them what you really think. Cause it's like, uh, I was just as surprised as everyone else was, <laughs> believe me. But, uh, but you know, but in hockey, like timing is everything I feel like. And, uh, and, and I had, I had good timing. I feel like I played my best hockey when I was going to become a free agent. So that's, that's how that stuff works sometimes. And, uh, I also in Colorado, you, or, uh, you become a free agent, I believe at 27 years old in the NHL, you can be unrestricted. And, uh, so I was on two way deals up until then. And then I had my, my first, um, experience with Colorado when I got called up after, you know, three, three and a half or three and three quarter years, I played like 25 games at the end of uh, one of the seasons with Colorado. And then uh, the next year they wanted to sign me um, to a multi-year extension, you know, like to a two year, two or three year two way contract. If people don't know, that's two different, uh, two different pay stubs, whether you're in the American league or the NHL. And that basically means about a zero on the end of your paycheck. Yeah, 10 times you know? different. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, they wanted to sign me to a couple year deal, but, uh, I remember me and my agent, uh, talked it over and we were, we were just thinking, well, if you sign a one year deal, if they would sign you to it, then you'll be unrestricted that next year. So we, we bet on ourselves again and got really lucky that no injuries happened and whatever. And that was the best year of my career, probably that, uh, um, that last year in Colorado. So that's what led to that free agency the you know the opportunity to be able to go to toronto so wow yeah you know i want to go back <clears throat> to the previous question i asked and and you talked about the the hall of famers you played with but uh who was the toughest competitor in front of the net the guy that gave you the the hardest time there was there was definitely some wars um guys like uh holmstrom in detroit he, I think he, he had full body armor on. I think he had uh, he had pads stitched onto the bottom of his shoulder pads, and he, I think every inch of his body was covered. But for that reason, that guy was not moving no matter what you did to him. Like when you know, when I was saying before, like you always wanted to be hard to play against, but it then it doesn't matter when you get to that level. Like these guys, that's their job is standing there, and and they aren't going to move for anything. You know what I mean? When no matter what you do to them, and. Uh, he uh, he sticks out to me for sure, and you know he has a reputation of that, of course, for for everybody. I feel like, but for myself, and then uh, just a couple other. I mean, there was you know, there's obviously some real warriors in that league, and I remember playing against Chara a few times. I oh. remember I had to go into the corner oh. with him one time. You know, when there's a soft dump in the corner and the D-man, it's like a D-man's worst fear when you got to go chase down a puck when you know there's guys bearing down on you like that. And I remember I looked and I saw it was him coming. I'm like, oh no! But, but <laughs> this you, isn't gonna be good. Yeah, but but you can't do you know you can't. Uh, so they say pull the shoot and uh, hit the brakes and let him go first because that's just not cutting it, especially for like a rookie or a second year guy. So I remember I just think and I tried to lean into him before we got to the puck, and uh, he literally reached over me and around me with his you know. 10 foot stick and, and poke the puck. So he, he didn't, he didn't plaster me through the glass, but, uh, but he could have, you know, and, 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 but he just, I remember just him reaching around me and poking it by. And then I think he went and got it. And, but it was just, uh, that, that was another guy that was just, uh, you know, next level tough and scary. Yeah, beast. You know? Yeah. Definitely a beast. If, uh, if you could pick anybody 
in your era or now to be your D partner? Who would that be? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I played with uh, John Michael Lyles when I was in Colorado, and uh, and then I got to play with Cabriolet a little bit in in Toronto. Um, and uh, I'd have to say, you know, maybe one of those two guys, because they, they, we complemented e- each other well. Um, one thing that happened in Toronto is, is uh, we had a lot of, lot of righties. Okay. So uh, I, I had to play a lot on the left side in, in uh, Toronto, which I was, wasn't accustomed to. And for, for a meat and potatoes type of defenseman, um, playing on your offside isn't, uh, you know, necessarily – something you'd want to do and I've never and I had never done that in my life but uh so I say that in Toronto because me and Cabriolet he was a lefty and I was a righty so when I got to play on the right side me and him we, we had some good games together and then um with uh Jam Lyles too um in Colorado that was uh we we played some good hockey together too I feel like so that was and for me personally I don't know what they would say don't ask them but you know <laughs> well let's assume the worst any any bad things you want to say about them <laughs> <laughs> no it sounds like they would have been good good partners for you yeah for sure okay. it, it was a good good mix so between the three leagues the ECHL the AHL and the NHL you put together a 525 game professional career what stands out to you as you look back? Oh man, it's uh, it felt like more than that. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. It was 500 games. I got kind of a a late start in the pro game, meaning I didn't get there until I was maybe 24 years old, or there's 18 year olds coming in. But uh, when you're um in the minor leagues and stuff, I don't I don't know if people realize, you know how how that works in terms of riding the bus and oh, playing man. four games in five nights in four different cities. And, you know, the bumps and bruises that you get, um, you know, we used to call the American League the jungle. That's kind of a, you know, a term that guys would use uh, that kind of came from my era. I don't know how it is really anymore. I don't know if it's as nasty as it used to be. But also my first year um, in playing in the American League was the year of the lockout. Oh, so, so there's so the more competition. Yes. Yeah. And it was that league. I mean, I don't, I don't know what league would have been better in the world. You know what I mean? Sure. Cause the, each team had like, uh, you know, maybe five to eight guys come down that would be more or less the younger guys that were on the NHL teams that they wanted their guys to play in the American league that year. And so the league was just stacked, you know, so you're playing against Jason Spezza's and, you know, it was, it was just, uh, I just remember, you know, how good the league was that year. And, uh, and also in the American League, where there, is, there used to be like one heavyweight on each team, in the American <laughs> League, there was like four to five heavyweights on each team. Like when we, we'd go play the Philadelphia Phantoms and uh, Mike Richards and Jeff Carter were out there, but there was also like Craig Berube, PJ Stock, um, you know, and I could go on and on. They had like five guys that we would go on the old spectrum and they would, they would, pound the hell out of us usually every time you know i remember because that was always a day trip from hershey too so this is why i remember this you're going into the old spectrum for one and then it's a day trip so you got like a three or so hour bus ride oh. so there's no there's no pregame nap and you know oh, you're out of you kind of yeah. out of your element there as a hockey guy and uh and then uh, and the weather was always crummy driving into philly we'd call it gotham city and, you know you're pulling in on the bus and you know you know you're about you're like marching to your execution almost you know you feel like when the weather was crummy and you're like we'd say pulling into gotham city and then you're in the old spectrum where you know there many a guys you know would be bleeding on that ice you know but then you were in the old locker room as well which all the the old time guys um also dressed in, you know, when they were the, when they were the bullies and oh, the broad yeah. street bullies yeah. and everything. So the, in the training room, I remember there was a bunch of guys that had signed the wall, like Gretzky was on there and all. So it was really neat to see stuff like that. And, oh, yeah. uh, but you, you could only imagine, um, the fear that, that those, that those old teams, the flyers had brought because the phantoms definitely had that aura about them back, back then, you know? So it was, uh, it was definitely interesting and some of the most intimidating games I've ever played in, for sure. <laughs> Even the fans, uh, funny story. One time, me and uh, one of my buddies, Cody McCormick, who I played with in in Colorado and in the minors a little bit. He was my roommate and stuff. And uh, we were coming off the ice after after one of the 
the Phantoms games. And the, the, the fans were crazy. And they were literally hanging over the thing. They were trying to throw stuff at you and hit you. And I remember, I can't remember if it was me or Cody, but someone took the, the tip of their stick and, and slashed one of the fans on his toe. Oh. And, and, you know, just because they were getting us with stuff, I figured it was fair game. You know, these yeah. Philly fans are nuts. <laughs> so, uh, but long story short, the guy was waiting at our bus. <laughs> After, oh, when we came no, out there, he yeah. wanted a piece yeah, of yeah, yeah, he did. He, he came, he came for more. But luckily, there was some security out there and stuff, and they they shoot him off. But uh, yeah, that, that that's one good story that I remember from, from playing in the American League. Wow. <laughs> no backing down in Philly, baby. No, no. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, you had mentioned, you know, uh, your Achilles' heel was you had to take weight off, and then you're talking about the AHL where there's you know four heavyweights on each team. Where did you fall in in your in your career? Were, were you uh, were you a glove dropper? Did yeah. you have to do that at all? Or? I, I did. You know, in the minor leagues, I, I fought a lot more than I ever did in uh, you know when I when I made it to the NHL. But uh, so I was in my fair share, maybe eight to ten, you know, maybe a year in the minor leagues. But uh, I was more of a middleweight. I, you know, I, I'd, I'd have to stick up for myself here or there every once in a while. Probably the one of the heavyweights I remember fighting is Riley Cote. I don't know if you guys remember that name. He played in Philly as well. Okay. I fought him, and then I think uh, I got the first first few in, and then uh, all of a sudden the next thing I remember, my jersey was over my head, and I could see a fist flying by my face and my jersey. <laughs> you know, I could just see. Choo, choo. So I was like, huh, maybe I'll go down now. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so there, you know, there is there was some fights, but you know, that, I would try to play hockey and, and play a hard game, but dropping the gloves wasn't necessarily, um, you know, something that I like to do all the time. You know, but yeah. what time was, and place? Oh right. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you believe was the skill set that you brought to the table that Colorado said we want you and we're going to bring you up because of that skill set? Well, I, I think it's just that steady Eddie type of defenseman, you know. Um, if you don't get scored on, you know, and, and then you can contribute every once in a while with, uh, you know, a point here or there or, or playing physical, blocking shots, you know, stuff like that. Um, that that first full year I played in Colorado, I think I led the team in hits and in blocks. Oh. And then – and or no, sorry, not not in blocks because we had some of the best shot blockers in the league. With Carlos Scrashens and Brett Clark were on that team, so they'd be up in the two hundreds or you know maybe even three hundreds block shots. But uh, but I puck eaters, yeah. yeah, yeah. And there was some uh, guys are really good at that at that level. It's really hard to get a puck through as a defenseman, you know, playing playing at that level. Um, but yeah, so th- I think a lot of that, just playing physical, playing hard every night, and making sure you show up every night is. Uh, is what mattered, you know, for me. Yeah, being reliable. Yep, absolutely. So, uh, post career, you spent three years as an assistant at Finlandia University here in the UP. Um, since closed, unfortunately. So, what led to the coaching opportunity, and is that something you always wanted to do? Yeah, I kind of always saw myself eventually coaching somewhere. Um, I always, you know, when I was young, I remember thinking, like, looking up to Don Miller, my coach here at Houghton and stuff, and thinking that that would be really cool to be a high school coach someday, you know, or something like that. But uh, when I got home, I, you know, took a few years and, uh, you know, just got all the fishing and hunting and that type of stuff out of my, out of my, uh, all the stuff I missed out on when I was playing, you know, in the fall hunting and fishing, which I love to do still. Um, but uh, uh, Joe Burkar was the coach at Finlandia. Him and uh, Brian Hannon, who was also, um, he had a great career in Europe and, you know, was a standout at Michigan Tech. Um, they, were, they were the two coaches over there at Finlandia. And Joe uh, was my coach at the Marquette Electricians when, oh, wow. we, when we won the state sure. championship yeah. that year, my sophomore year in high school. So, um, so I obviously knew those guys from that. And I would skate with Brian when I was a young kid uh, up at Tech and whatnot. They would uh, have me come skate with them when I was young, which was a big deal for me in terms of development and me getting to to see you know how good these guys really are you know and stuff as a as a young man and uh so yeah that's kind of how it came about i talked to to joe and brian and uh they were just wondering if i'd be willing to help out and i said why not this is this is great and i always i always kind of wanted to coach and it was just something that i always thought i you know might be decent at and uh 
you know, that, that's kind of how that played out. It was, you know, I consider those guys friends and, uh, and they asked me if I wanted to help out. So I'm really glad that they did. You know, it was, nice. it's great. Yeah. You were inducted into the uh, UP of Michigan sports hall of fame, 2019. How does that feel? Was, what did that mean to you? Well, that was, uh, I'm a, I'm a, a very proud Uper and, and, uh, copper country born and raised kid. I've always, uh, use the UP as, you know, uh, motivation for me for guys that maybe weren't playing anymore or guys that I played with and just the history we have up here. And when, when I heard about it, I, I wasn't really expecting that either. And, uh, and when I heard about it, it was, it was just a total honor. You know, obviously it was, it's probably the only hall of fame I'll ever make, but, uh, <laughs> you know, so, so just, just being eligible and then eventually getting the nod for that. It was, it was a really big deal for me and, and my family and stuff. So it's kind of neat that, uh, you're recognized for that. Congratulations. Yeah. I appreciate so it. I just have two, two really quick questions. Okay. So you're currently an assistant coach at your alma mater. Do you have any Jeff fingers in the pipeline? Well, see, I, I don't know if, you know, there, there sure could be, we got, we got, we got all of our defensemen returning. Uh, we lost four of four seniors this year that, that are, you know, that were, were very high level high school players and that are most three of them, I believe moved on to, to junior and, uh, Oh, that's good. Yeah. I mean, for you, that, that, that that's shows a, you're developing. That's, oh, yes. Absolutely. That, and that's, yeah. a, that's a big deal, yeah. you know, um, for coming out of high school and being able to go out to play in the in the null or you know something like that that's that's a really big deal to come out of michigan high school and be able to do that so so that's really cool and uh you know and that's the thing i don't know if anybody would have uh you know you asked if there's any jeff fingers i don't know if any, if they would have thought i was a jeff finger back sure. then you yep. know what i mean so yep. that uh, the development that can happen you know once you move on from high school it's kind of all up to the kid and and how much they want to sacrifice and put into it so it's definitely a possibility i would say for sure so we're here in the, the Houghton Gremlins locker room, you know, and how many guys have come through here and, you know, had great careers. And, uh, you know, I'm looking at all the motivational things that you've got posted up here. So what's the what's the big thing, the biggest thing you want to pass on to your kids? Well, it's just it's just that uh, that commitment and that sacrifice every day at practice. I think it's more about consistency at this level. Um, when I talk to our kids, I always, I always try to put myself, um, or, or think about what I want to say to them in terms of what I used to, how I used to think when I was their age, you know what I mean? And as a, you know, a 40 something year old man now, you think quite a bit differently than you did when you were a 15 <laughs> to 18 year old kid, as, oh, yeah. as I'm sure you guys can imagine, <laughs> oh, yeah. you know, and, uh, <laughs> so, so that's just the consistency and the work ethic that I see and, and compared to when I played, um, like I told you earlier, I don't know if we were on, on mic yet, but, uh, like we got our kids working out four days a week in the summertime and stuff. We okay. didn't, we didn't do that when, when I was that age, you know what I mean? Nobody did, you know, we, we yeah. would, we would go lift weights and stuff, but it wasn't, you know, we weren't doing sprints and plyometrics and, and lifting as a team, you know, um, back then. So I just see these kids work ethics and, and what they, they, they commit to this thing, you know, day in, day out, even in the summertime. And it's super impressive and, and they're making big gains. And, uh, but again, it's just that consistency. I feel like if you show up, showing up is three quarters of the battle. I feel like, you know, whether Absolutely. it's to the weight room or to the rink or in anything in life, maybe, you know, yeah. showing up is, you know, a big part of the battle, so yeah. the consistency, I'd say. I've got two uh, two questions for you. Uh, the first one, I'm going to go back to when you went to Toronto. Were there certain teams that you wanted your agent to reach out to? Were there any off the table that you didn't want to go to? H how did how did you feel about going to Toronto? I mean, was that your choice, or, or what happened? Yeah, it's it's an interesting process, you know, when you're kind of just looking to claw your way in and then all of a sudden you're unrestricted and then you actually have options. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's, it's a, it's a weird thing. Um, but yeah, I just remember, you know, that July one, which is free agent, the day of free agency in the NHL. Um, I remember waking up in the morning and, uh, you know, and then 
the phone didn't start ringing yet from my agent, but there was numerous teams and numerous offers. I, I wasn't, there was no one off the table or anything, but as soon as I heard the Maple Leafs, all I could think about is like when I was a kid watching CBC, you know, sure. and that, that was the game we'd get is Toronto. It was Toronto or Montreal. And, uh, just, you know, it's, it's like, uh, it's, it's like a religion up there for them. And it, and it was always, I didn't really think about, um, you know, everything that went along with it. I just kind of, I thought about it, I guess you could say as a kid, meaning like I could be a maple leaf, like you, you're kind of, it's kind of surreal, you know? And, uh, so I, I would say just, I wanted to see what a Canadian market would be like because Colorado and Denver, Denver is one of the only big cities I would ever consider moving to it's it's so beautiful out there i don't know if you guys have been but yeah. it's it's gorgeous you know and i mean the weather's always nice and it's everything about it is beautiful and uh so i didn't necessarily want to leave but i knew this was my one shot at going to free agency so i took it and when i heard toronto um i was just i told my agent i was like well i mean if if they would take me and they were one of the you know the higher money offers on the table at the time it didn't take long for me to i think i I decided by noon, you know what I mean? It wasn't like I was waiting around, you know, to see what else was out there. Um, I know there was, op there was, you know, a handful of other teams that were in the ballpark of the money, maybe not as much. Maybe that was another reason why, you know, Toronto won there. But, uh, that, uh, but yeah, it was just, just being a Maple Leaf was kind of, you know, looking at it through a kid's eyes, I guess. Yeah. Original six. Yeah, really. Do you want to share what that free agency contract was? Well, it's uh, it's online, I think, but uh, yeah, it was it was uh, four years or three years, fourteen. Was that is that what it was? Yeah, four years, fourteen. Four years, fourteen. Yep, yeah. Not bad for a kid from the UP of Michigan. Yeah, that's that's for sure. That's for sure. And and you know, once you once you when you see those numbers on paper, it's just kind of like you don't know what to think about it. You know what I mean? It's just like <laughs> is that real? Yeah, yeah. And and you know, your everyone, you know, your parents, no one can really believe it. Everyone's kind of in shock. You know what I mean? I didn't come from money or anything, so and uh, it was it was just really surreal. I'd I'd say that was the, that's the best way to describe that for sure. So. And and the last one I got is what was the final deciding factor for Jeff Finger to decide it's time to step away from the game and retire as a pro? Yeah. Um, so throughout the years, and uh, from my style of play, and now they they just started kind of talking about head injury and whatnot. You know, back when I was you know going through my time as a pro, and uh, so that it, it it came down to injury. And head injury for the most part. Um, okay. I ended I ended the, my last year with the Marlies. I had a really bad concussion, and they started coming more more frequent and easier. The concussions when I was when I was in Green Bay and in college, like you could have probably hit me with a baseball bat, and you know I, I wouldn't have you know I might have stumbled, <laughs> but you know it. it uh, but as you go go keep going and you keep taking more blows and more hits. Um, they come easier then. It's, you know, the, well, like they say in boxing, it's like a, they say he's punch drunk or he's got a glass jaw, you know. I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of what, you know, that, that's the best way I could explain it. And just kind of a nothing play. The last one I got it was a nothing play. I had my stick out and a guy came by and a shoulder clipped my chin and, uh, I was up in Newfoundland and, uh, I'll never forget because, and just for how long that one lasted too, you know, you, Normally, you wouldn't say a word like that. I've I, I've only been diagnosed technically with two in my life, but I've had you know many many concussions. Uh, yeah, and uh, but you just don't say anything. You know, when you guys were young, and when I was even young, there was no such thing. You know, right. if if you're saying I can't go, and you don't have a physical injury like a broken arm or something, then you're just being a, a baby, or you know what I mean. That's yeah. that's kind of how it was. And then when you are playing pro hockey. Um, someone else is coming right behind you. So if you give up your spot and say, I can't go because I have a headache, you know, that's not really cutting it. And that's just, that's just the, the, the reality of what things were like back then, you know, back then, you know, whatever, however long it, it's back not that long, not that, yeah, long you know, yeah. not that long, but, but, it, but on the other hand, how much the game has grown and, and, and uh, how different things are now, it kind of was the, a long time ago in terms of the, the growth of the game, I'd yeah. say, you know, and uh, so that was that was the main thing. Um, I had an opportunity to go play in Germany after after my pro career over here, and and I just 
and I was still suffering the effects of that concussion even into the summertime um, of that year after after I got done playing and and I was just thinking you know um, I made a good run and it's just not worth it for the 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 symptoms that you're suffering once you get a, a really bad concussion uh, for anybody who's had one knows but a lot of things go into it you know you just don't the depression and you just don't feel like yourself you know what I mean it's just it's really hard to overcome and again like I said they just come more frequent and uh and and they last longer you know the symptoms last longer so that one kind of really really scared me and got me and I was just like you know I would have loved this one of my biggest regrets is not being able to go to Europe and and experience that over there as well because I've heard um, wonderful things. That's where Brian Hannon played, and uh, and his son Connor Hannon, who I coached at Finlandia, is is playing over there in Germany right now. And uh, you know, and it, it would it would just been a wonderful experience yep. to go to go yeah. play over there. But um, so that's one of the only things I could say that I really wish could have happened. You know, but uh, yeah, that that's what led to that. Is just the the compounding of injuries over the years. You know, everything hurts. By the time you're you're that age, you know, I was I was the oldest guy on Toronto's in Toronto's organization my last year. So they were going a different direction and you know, when you're the oldest guy in an NHL organization, I never thought I'd be able to say that, but uh it's kind of a kind of a cool badge, I guess, yeah. but yeah. I don't know I don't know Absolutely. what it means. If, if awesome. it's if it's bad or good, I don't know. Maybe it's time to let the kids play and get well, out of here. So it's a sign of a long career, yeah. which is which yeah. is wonderful right. and that's what you had. Yeah. Jeff this has been an absolute pleasure. We appreciate you taking the time, inviting us up to D in your locker room, and appreciate your time. Oh, it's my pleasure, you guys, and I appreciate you guys coming up here and, and taking the time as well. This is great, so I really appreciate it. Well, your story's been fun. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please don't forget to like us on your favorite social media platform. Give us a like. Give us a rating. Give us a comment. Helps us stay in the game. Mogi? Absolutely. And again, a big thank you to our special guest, Jeff Finger. And good luck to you and the Gremlins this year, by the way. Appreciate it, you guys. Absolutely. As well as our audience, please remember our sponsors, Riverside Bike and Skate and Chippewa Valley Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Follow us on your favorite social media platforms as well as YouTube. And remember, folks, until next time, keep your head on a swivel and stay on your inside edges. Be a brother.